Welcome to Adult Bible Study, First Baptist Gainesville. I'm Sandra Sharon, and I'm an adult Bible study teacher here during what we would call normal times. We're continuing our study of the gospel according to Mark, and if you will join me in prayer now. Holy Father, today as we explore some differences between ritualistic worship and the worship of the true living God and our ultimate relationship with him, give us clarity to discern the differences and give us an understanding of what it means to be led by the Spirit. Keep our hearts and minds focused on you and totally committed to following you in your way. In your gracious name, I pray. Amen. So, fasting had an honored place in first century Judaism. It was an oblig obligatory day of atonement, Yom Kippur. It was to be the day in the Jewish calendar when the people were to be in sorrow and affliction as atonement for their sins. It was the only annual public fast required in the Mosaic law. Throughout scripture, fasting refers to abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. Devout persons all, all, uh, often fasted every week, Mondays and Thursdays, from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And the Pharisees would fast on those days and go into the marketplace because it was the busiest on on one of those days and they would make sure that everybody saw their fasting. In, the, in ancient times there were approximately 20 fast days. Now there are about 29 I read. Um, and from Matthew 6, 16 and 17, and when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do. For they try to look miserable and disheveled so people will admire, will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that is the only reward they will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face. Then no one will notice that you're fasting except your father who knows what you do in private. And your father, who sees everything, will reward you. And now a word about piety. There is great danger in the practice of piety. Nothing is as offensive as people who make a great show of their religious faithfulness. And Jesus never spoke more angrily than when he spoke of these people. He called them hypocrites. The word comes from the stage where people put on a mask to act a part in a play. Christian behavior can be put on like a mask also. It has the immediate effect on the spectators of giving a pleasing impression and just as at a play, they will often break into applause. But there's no applause in heaven for such people. And there will be no applause for us if we become their understudies and take their place on the contemporary religious stage. From Isaiah 58, 1 through 9, shout, a full-throated shout, hold nothing back, a trumpet blast shout. Tell my people what's wrong with their lives. Face my family Jacob with their sins. They're busy, busy, busy at worship and love studying all the time. To all appearances, they're a nation of right living people, law abiding, God honoring. They ask me, what's the right thing to do? And they love having me on their side. 
but they also complain. Why do we fast and you don't even look our way? Why do we humble ourselves and you don't even notice? Well, here's why. The bottom line on your fast days is profit. You drive your employees much too hard. You fast, but at the same time bicker and fight. You fast, but you swing a mean fist. The kind of fasting you do won't get your prayers off the ground. Do you think this is the kind of fast day I'm after? A day to show off humility? To put on a pious face and parade around solemnly in black? Do you call that fasting? A fast day that I, God, would like? This is a kind of fast day I'm after. To break the chains of injustice. To rid of exploitation in the workplace. To free the oppressed. To cancel debts. What I'm interested in seeing you do is sharing your food with the hungry. Inviting the homeless poor into your homes. Putting clothes on the shivering ill-clad. Being available to your own families. Do this and the lights will turn on. And your lives will turn around at once. Your righteousness will pave your way. The God of glory will secure your passage. Then when you pray, God will answer. You'll call out for help, and I'll say, here I am. So, true worship was more than performing religious rituals, going to the temple every day, fasting, listening to scripture being read. These people missed the point of a living, vital relationship with God. Likewise, he doesn't want us acting pious when we have unforgiven sin in our hearts, and are performing sinful practices. Genuine worship involves demonstrating our faith through positive actions such as showing compassion for those who are poor, helpless, or oppressed. So to cite some ancient and some not so ancient thoughts about uh, fasting, the normal kind of fasting involve normal means of fasting involve abstaining from all food solid or liquid but not from water there are different kinds of fast normal or regular fast and absolute fast jesus did not command that individuals fast he simply gave instruction on the proper exercise of a common practice of his day Fasting must forever center on God by being God-initiated and God-ordained. One should refrain from calling attention to their discipline of fasting. More than any other discipline, fasting reveals the things that control us. And now our scripture for chosen for today is Mark 2, uh, 18 through 22. Once when John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, some people came to Jesus and asked, Why don't your disciples fast like John's disciples and the Pharisees do? Jesus replied, Do wedding guests fast while celebrating with a groom? Of course not. They can't fast while the groom is with them, but someday the groom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wineskin, for the wine would burst the wineskins, and the wine and the skins would both be lost. New wine calls for new wineskins. In this scripture for today, John's disciples, um, we're told, were mourning because of their rest or the death of, of their teacher. This is uh, narrated later in the scriptures. Thus, it's likely that John's disciples followed the customs of the Pharisees. 
the disciples of John the Baptist and the Pharisees fasted in the light of the coming kingdom of God, of the coming kingdom of God. But Jesus believed that the kingdom of God was coming already in his own ministry, for God was manifesting his presence in Jesus' ministry. The sick were being healed, demons were being driven out, the good news was being preached. All of that meant good news for sinners. So in Luke 5, this same story is recounted where um, they list the reasons for mourning. No one mourned when there were reasons to be joyful. In Luke 5, there is some indication that Jesus lived an active and joyful life. Some people ask Jesus why his disciples were always eating and drinking. One of his responses in verse 35 was, I'm here now, so be glad. Later, when I'm gone, you can be sad. Secondly, how can people mourn their sins when Jesus is with them announcing forgiveness and reconciliation? That just doesn't make sense. Jesus nowhere requires of his followers that they fast. He denounced the use of fasting as a public display of piety and instructed his disciples whenever they might fast to be sure they were motivated to be sure that they were motivated by a godly purpose. We do know from scripture that the Christians of the early second century practiced fasting. And they were instructed to fast as well as pray for their enemies and to fast also in connection with baptism. And the early Christians were instructed not to fast on Mondays and Thursdays with the hypocrites, the Jews, but on Wednesdays and Fridays. The original question why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? J Jesus answered in three ways. The first way he answered was with the image of a wedding. A wedding is a period of joy and in ancient Israel. It was a period of prolonged feasting uh, before, during, and after following the wedding. It would be inappropriate to mourn and fast during such a celebration. The bridegroom and bride and their guests were relieved of religious obligations during wedding celebrations. Normally, the wedding guests would not mourn after a wedding either. The wedding, according to Jewish teaching, was a picture of the day of salvation. Well, in scripture, the Davidic king is sometimes pictured as a bridegroom. In this instance, the bridegroom was Jesus himself. And the people would understand that. The day will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them as fulfilled in his death. Then they will fast. So the king has come announcing forgiveness of sins, acceptance into God's kingdom, good news. There will be a day of atonement, a time for sorrow, a time when the king dies for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. And we are told that the people would have understood those images in ancient Israel. Now Jesus speaks to the question, why did Jesus' followers not observe the religious customs of their contemporaries? And then Jesus now responds in two parables. In verse 21, he says, Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. You cannot repair an old garment with new cloth that has not been washed or pre-strunk. In essence, Jesus said his new message was too vibrant, too different to be fitted into old patterns or old institutions. 
He didn't actually condemn the old as treated as having passed its useful period. Again, an old garment cannot be patched by new cloth that not, has not been washed or pre shrunk Then again, Jesus had come preaching that the kingdom of God has drawn near. He didn't intend to alter old traditions or to patch up old institutions. He believed that the kingdom of God has drawn near. It will not come at the end of life or in the future. It is drawing near. Jesus' gospel cannot be connected to the old ways. This is new. This was fresh. This is something exciting that's happening here. And then the second parable in verse 22. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the wine would burst the wineskins, and the wine and the skins would both be lost. New wine calls for new wineskins. Wineskins were made of, from whole goat hides, from the neck to the top of the legs. The openings were tied off and the skins were tanned. Old skins would be brittle and would burst from the pressure of fermentation. Jesus' word is like new wine. The traditions were so brittle and so rigid and so rutted that they were like brittle wine skins. The two are not compatible. The nature of the message of Jesus requires fresh wine skins in every generation. There is nothing untouchable in custom or in tradition or in the structure of an institutional church. Let me read that with the correct emphasis. There is nothing untouchable in custom or tradition or in the structure of an institutional church. Nothing must be so sacred as to hamper the forgiveness of a merciful God or restrain the practice of Christian love toward one's fellow men. When first told, these parables would have been applied to such customs as fasting, requirements of the oral law, Sabbath observance, and later the parables would have been applied to measures such, such as uh, circumcision, eating certain foods, temple worship, or worship with non-Christian Jews in the synagogues. The point of these parables seems rather to be the damage which the new does to the old than the opposite. If we try to fit the freedom and calling of Jesus into our old patterns and institutions, we shall not only miss what Jesus would do for us, but we'll destroy also what we've had before. It is true that the old garment and the aged wineskin had in the nature of things already served their useful time. But no one can become a true disciple if he holds on to his old life. And that's from Mark 8:34. Many of us learned in Sunday school that a parable was an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That's about as good a definition as you can find, but, but it needs one clarification. We must not think of the heavenly part as something far off or remote. The heavenly meaning isn't reserved for some kind of afterlife. Believe it or not, it's right here now, the kingdom was proclaimed by Christ, but it was also initiated by him. And so the heavenly meaning is immediately relevant. The point of the parables is to say that the kingdom of God has come upon us, that it comes by grace, and that we must respond to it now. Not in the future, not at the end of our life, but now. Looked at another way, or perhaps more clarifying, the old covenant 
was a covenant under the Mosaic law, traditional Judaism. It was just plain legalism. The new covenant is a covenant empowered by the Holy Spirit and a deep-rooted relationship with Jesus Christ. Look at this prophecy of Jeremiah in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 31. The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I love them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days. I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, You should know the Lord. For everyone, from the least to the greatest, will know me already, says the Lord. And I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. The old covenant broken by the people would be replaced by a new covenant. The foundation of this new covenant is Jesus Christ. The old covenant did not have the power to transform people's hearts or give them the ability to obey. The new covenant had revolutionary power involving not only Israel and Judah, but even the Gentiles. It offers a unique personal relationship with God himself. With his laws written on individual hearts instead of on stone tablets. Jeremiah looked forward to the day when Jesus would come to establish this covenant. And through his forgiveness, all sins would be forgive, forgotten. For us today, this new covenant is here. We have the wonderful opportunity to have a fresh start and establish a, per, a permanent personal relationship with God. Eugene Peterson in the message interprets it this way. He says, my counsel is this. Live freely animated and motivated by God's spirit. Then you won't feel the compulsions of selfishness. For there is a root of sinful self-interest in us that it is at odds with a free spirit. Just as a free spirit is incompatible with selfishness, these two ways of life are antithetical, so that you cannot live at times one way and at times another way according to how you feel on any given day. Why don't you choose to be led by the Spirit and to escape the erratic compulsions of a law-dominated existence? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Now, Jesus is the foundation of new life that is at odds with the world. He is not just a new addition to our lives. And then from Mark 8, 34, Then, calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. But what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, guide us as we attempt to turn from our selfish ways and do your will by following you. Teach us to include one another as you include us. Teach us to welcome and accept each other 
as you welcome and accept us. Guide us to be a community of Jesus that is involved in transforming our own lives and supporting those around us who are trying to do likewise. We acknowledge that to live in this way is to do your heavenly will. Amen. Thank you.